the desperate crush in the Gaza Strip. More than a million people ordered by Israel to head south. <laughs> they have a dire need for food and water, and there's a lot of it just across the border. The only hope for Palestinians trapped in the enclave is to cross the border into Egypt, but so far, Egypt hasn't let them in. Adnan Abu Hasna is a UN worker near that border. Uh, Adnan, lots of confusion whether people will be able to use the crossing at Rafah. And as we do this interview, it's almost 10 p.m. on Sunday. What's happening there now? Nothing happened like now. Rafah, crossing point, is closed. Nothing is allowed in Gaza. No humanitarian corridor or, you know, or aid at all. For the people who are still in Gaza, how would you describe their situation? It is a disaster. It is a catastrophe, actually. Nearly one million Palestinians deflated. And uh, look, there is no fuel, uh, water. People are drinking dirty waters. It's about, uh, you know, death and life now. Have you talked to anybody who is staying in the northern part of Gaza despite Israel's warnings to leave? Have you been in contact with any of them? Yes, yesterday I was there, actually. I was in Gaza City. So I met some people, you know, uh, there. You know, some of them, they left uh, their homes and they went, actually, to the southern part of Gaza. They find out that the shelters are full of displaced people. So they decided to go back to, uh, to their homes. And others, you know, say that they cannot leave uh, their homes. They believe that it is like Exodus, and uh, it is the second Palestinian Nakba since 1948. So they prefer to stay and to bear, you know, the consequences. Tonight, do you see any hope in this situation? There is no choice. They either, you know, to let Gaza people die or to let the fuel, food, medicine, to get into Gaza. And I think that the international community will not allow that uh, to happen. Okay, Adnan, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Adnan Abu Hasna is with the UN's relief agency in Gaza. As we just heard, some living in northern Gaza are choosing to stay, and that is an increasingly dangerous situation, as Israeli troops are expected to move with a ground offensive fairly soon. Let's bring in Scott Clancy uh, for this part of the story. Scott's a retired major general with the Canadian Armed Forces. And, and, and let me start with this. Once Israeli forces move in, uh, they're, they're going into a densely urban setting. Describe for us some of the challenges they're about to face. Well, you know, that's a great question to be able to contextualize this for Canadians. Uh, very close terrain is how we in the military would term that. So that the buildings form their own mountains, if you will, except that people can shoot right down onto the troops that are moving along the ground. And you have to clear up into each one of those buildings and you don't have long sight lines for your weapons. So that the benefits of modern weaponry, precision at standoff, you know, where you can stand beyond where someone can reach out and hurt you, it, those things don't exist. So that's going to be a very tough street by street room by room slog and the Hamas is going to further complicate this by being amongst the civilian population and not identifying themselves as you know militants until the last second so they'll ambush and they'll use whatever devious things they can to include countermanding the laws of war to be able to kill the Israeli defense forces and, and what does that mean for the safety of civilians the the role of of Israeli soldiers if you can't immediately discern between combatants uh, from Hamas and, and ordinary civilians? You know, that's going to be a very close dance. Uh, and I think the Israeli Defense Forces, one of the reasons why they paused here, you know, initially it was a uh, ultimatum to get out within a few number of hours, and now it's turned into uh, conditions-based, you know, as the civilian population leaves. And I think we're seeing more people leave northern Gaza and not heed Hamas's directive to stay put. I think that's telling as to how serious civilians are taking this pending invasion. But what that means is that they're going to be deliberate. 
And if the Israeli Defense Forces are more deliberate, then they'll be able to delineate between that which is a threat. You know, an armed person uh, is a threat. An unarmed person, you know, on the balance of things, you consider them to be a civilian until they pose a specific threat. Now, there's ways to get around that. Hamas is going to use those ways, and that's going to cause casualties for the Israeli Defense Forces. Everybody has to realize that, that that's the, the cost of urban warfare against a terrorist organization. And, and I guess adding a, a level of, of complication to this already difficult urban warfare is tunnels. Hamas says that, um, or at least the reports of Hamas using tunnels to, to hold hostages, to move weapons. And I think they've claimed that, that they're going to pop up out of those tunnels at any time and, uh, and, and use those in trying to repel the Israeli forces. And I think uh, you're right. I mean, the aspect of tunnels adds a, a yet another dimension. In, in warfare like this, we do consider everything like the three dimensions. Uh, you know, we talked about the buildings up, but it's also the subterranean architecture that goes down. And you'll fight in and around that subterranean architecture, whether it's, you know, sewers or tunnels. The Israelis will use whatever technology they can to try and divine where those tunnels are. Hamas will use them even just to explode underneath armored columns and, and troops. Uh, so it's not just to pop up behind and ambush, but it also to, you know, take life uh, to the maximum extent that they can possible. So that will further complicate the Israeli Defense Forces fight. The original 24-hour deadline from Israel to people living in Gaza to move out of the northern part of Gaza is, is long past. And you mentioned one of the reasons for the delay may have been to give ample time, more time, for those civilians to move. Any other thing, any, anything else going on? that uh, might be explaining the delay here? Sure, I think there's a few things that are causing that delay. The first one was that, now linked to that, I think that the Israeli government and uh, the Israeli Defense Forces are now thinking through what the end state to this operation looks like in terms of the security situation so that it can be controlled and predictable into the future, so that you can have a political situation at some points, at least a path towards some semblance of a political situation and the basics of life and, and a sustainment for the, the Palestinian people, but not before the security situation is resolved. But those factors will drive how they do operations. So pausing now means that they're thinking through the end state, so how their deliberate operations will be affected. Now, the second thing is I think they're leaving some time for diplomacy from the United States, from the other Arab nations with Hamas to try and liberate those uh, hostages that are in Gaza. I, th I think that's prudent of them uh, to be able to do that. And then the third thing is that, you know, the United States has moved a second carrier strike group into the Eastern Med, uh, the USS Roosevelt, and they have stated openly that, you know, they have some of the best special forces operatives in the world, that, that it might be American forces that are freeing American hostages. And some of the time and space to perhaps enable those types of surgical operations is, is as well. And then lastly, I think that the humanitarian aspect is going to be front and center with the Israeli forces and the Israeli government. So I think they're going through the measures to try and open humanitarian corridors to enable the uh, relief of the suffering of the Palestinian people, not Hamas, but the Palestinian people in Gaza. Really nice having your analysis. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful evening. Retired Major General Scott Clancy is in Coburg, Ontario tonight. This continues to be a quickly developing story, and you can get the latest anytime on our website, cbcnews.ca, or on our CBC News app. Next, a Canadian is one of the few scientists in the world to hold an asteroid brought back from outer space. This team has been working towards this result, some people for over 20 years. What the research being done could unearth about our planet. A Canadian scientist gets the very rare chance to unlock secrets about how life began. Asteroids are really relics from the early solar system. Samples of the Bennu asteroid were captured by the spacecraft OSIRIS-REx and brought back to Earth. It's like taking a time machine. We're going to learn so much new information. And Professor Michelle Thompson joins us now from Purdue University in Indiana. Thank you very much for connecting with us. Thanks for having me. So, so how close have you come to the fragments of this asteroid? 
So I've actually been able to analyze them and hold them in my own gloved hands and do some of the first analyses on the samples from Asteroid Bennu. You know, as I've been reading about this, I, I was trying to think of an analogy in my my life, and and maybe it's like walking through Roman ruins in Europe and and feeling the weight of history and thinking a human hand put that brick there, you know, two thousand years ago. What was it like for you to have fragments of a asteroid in your hand? It has been honestly a dream come true. You know, this team has been working towards this result. Some people for over twenty years. And asteroids are really relics from the early solar system. There are these primitive fragments from the very earliest days, four and a half billion years ago when our solar system was forming. So it's like taking a time machine back into those conditions and to try and understand what the diversity of the building blocks for our solar system is. So there's nothing that can quite compare to holding that material uh, in your hands. So there's a fantastic headline, right, that we see all the time attached to this project, that this asteroid may unlock the mysteries of how life, uh, you know, started on Earth. And I think to myself, you know, how much of that is like hype and how real is that? So put it in perspective for us. No, this is really true for this asteroid. We chose it specifically as a target for this mission because we expected there to be it to be very carbon rich. And carbon molecules, these are the building blocks of what could have evolved into life on Earth. And they would be delivered to the surface of very primitive early Earth's history by material like what we got back from Bennu. Everything that we have on the surface of the Earth that is similar to this has been contaminated by you know, the material that we have on Earth's surface by Earth's atmosphere. And so we really have to go out and get it from the surface of an asteroid to be able to understand what those building blocks are and how they could have formed the recipe for life that evolved on our own planet. Will this confirm what we already think about how life developed uh, on Earth? Or do you think we're going to learn anything new from, from these fragments? We're gonna learn so much new information that I, I can't wait for the next few years of sample analysis. We have very limited amounts of material that we've gone and collected from an asteroid like this. And so this is gonna open up a whole new window of analytical opportunities to try and answer some of these really big picture questions. One of the reasons we're talking to you is that you are one of very few scientists who are going to have this, who have had and will have close access to these fragments. You are a Canadian, but what is it about your area of expertise that's put you on this team? So I got my undergraduate degrees in geological engineering and biology. So I've got kind of a diverse experience. And then I moved on to working in planetary science and analyzing material from other planetary bodies like the moon and asteroids. So I've been doing this since I started my, my graduate work. And I've got a lot of experience working with samples from the Apollo missions, exploration missions to other asteroids like the Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 missions. And so I've been very fortunate to have huge opportunities to work on material like this. So I, I do have some expertise when it comes to handling these materials. Yeah, and I, and I love the fact that the, the projects like this kind of, you know, we don't talk to scientists very much on, on a national newscast. So it's a nice opportunity uh, to do that. I, I want to play a clip that we gathered from your academic past. So uh, just listen to this. Oh, Michelle, congratulations uh, from all of us back at the West we're so proud of what you have accomplished and the things that you are doing now and will be doing and uh, keep going. And that'll give us lots more to watch and be interested in. So that's a science teacher. I think he taught you in grade nine and grade 12, John Cordukes. What is your reaction listening to that? That was the most beautiful surprise. Um, <laughs> I'm trying not to tear up. Uh, you know, growing up in small town, Southern Ontario, there wasn't really an obvious pathway for me to go from just north of Coburg, Ontario to working at NASA and working on these missions. And it was because of incredible mentors like that who really encouraged me and, and, and really had the confidence in me that I could do something like that that helped me forge this, this pathway. So that is so wonderful to hear and try and keep my emotions in check. <laughs> 
I, I love the connection between great teachers and 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 great students. And uh, and but let's talk a little bit more about that because there are hopefully people watching who have big dreams in whatever field. But let's say science for a moment. And where they happen to be in Canada, they're thinking, "There's no way I'm going to end up in whether it's NASA or or some other you know high kind of uh, achieving place." What other points were there in your career that were kind of pivotal in in helping you along your way? Well, when I first started as an undergraduate, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I loved science, but I was kind of all over the map. Uh, I was taking classes in biology. I took some in geology. And then it really struck a chord when I started thinking about, you know, rocks on Earth are great, but rocks from space <laughs> are better. Uh, and so I, I really had to reach out and find a community. The, the planetary science community in Canada isn't huge, but it is mighty, and they are so supportive of one another. So I just ended up talking to a professor who had given a lecture uh, on minerals on Mars. And he was so wonderful. He brought me to the meeting of Canadian planetary scientists that set me up with a summer internship. That internship turned into an internship at NASA. And, you know, it snowballed from there. So I would say, don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask for help in, in trying to forge the path that you want to take, because important the most important thing is having incredible mentors that can can try and guide you on uh, to get towards your dream so i was very fortunate to have people in my life who have encouraged me and helped me they might not even have known how to mm -hmm. how to do what i wanted but they could they could help me figure it out so yeah that's a great story what one last question for you um you've described what you're doing now your access to this asteroid as as kind of the highlight of a lifetime maybe the highlight of of a few lifetimes so i mean you're still a relatively young person what's next do you have any other kind of goals you'd like to achieve Absolutely. I mean, this has been a dream come true. The last few weeks, I keep looking around and asking myself, is this really happening? <laughs> uh, but I think the next move is that I want to do this all over again. You know, I'm at a, a point in my career where having the experience on this mission and being a part of such an incredible international team with links to Canada and the Canadian Space Agency, I want to do this again. And be involved from the ground floor, from the conception, the design, the initial stages of the mission, all the way through to bringing those samples back. So I'm looking forward already to the next adventure after this one, but I'm I'm trying to enjoy the moment and, and be so excited about the samples that we've just got back from Asteroid Bennu. Well, you are clearly excited. That excitement is uh, infectious. And uh, we'll check back with you when, when you get to the next step in this investigation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. There's another Canadian connection to this story. The Canadian Space Agency helped build a laser instrument aboard OSIRIS-REx, and the spacecraft is now on its way to the asteroid Apophis. It has a different chemical composition than Bennu, and in 2029, it's expected to get dramatically close to Earth as it whizzes by. Another site in our solar system had people across the Americas looking skyward. We're in oh angularity. It is a gorgeous sight to behold. How the ring of fire eclipsed all expectations. That's coming up in our moment. An annular solar eclipse took place this weekend. That means the moon passed in front of the sun, producing what's called a ring of fire in the sky. Onlookers gathered throughout the Americas to take a look, some breaking into joyous cheers as the moon and sun aligned. The spectacular sight is our moment. Wow. Wow. We're in oh my angularity. Goodness. It is a gorgeous sight to behold. This really puts our planet in perspective with the whole solar system, you know? Oh, it was incredible. <laughs> it was way more than I thought it would be. When it got to the full ring, that was just amazing to see. <laughs> you can almost hear a little bit of an awe and reverence among the crowd. It's crazy. That is, that is so wild. So that moon's shadow is traversing across the ground at a few thousand miles an hour, almost Mach 3. So even though it, it seems like it's lingering, it's actually making really good progress. Favorite part was definitely a ring of fire, because that's not something, again, you'll see every day, and it's going to be a long time before there's that opportunity again. I'm just in awe, you know? this I can feel the temperature drop. It feels just incredible. 
It's truly spectacular. It's one of those natural phenomenon that I just feel so lucky to be here at this place at this time to be able to observe it. Awe-inspiring, so I'm a little embarrassed to admit. Vancouver was one of the places where you could see this on Saturday. I didn't. I, I mean, I don't know if it was because it was cloudy at that moment of the day, because it wasn't cloudy all day. Maybe I was just inside when it happened. Next one will happen in Vancouver in 375 years from now, so there is that. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing. Good night.